insult to such a tasteful guitar player to play so distastefully on it. But anyway, there you go. There's your, your jingle. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much for taking the time time to do this. I've been really looking forward to this. Um, I mean, for the kind of music that myself and my peer group listen to, I don't think there's anybody on any instrument has played on as many records that we listen to over and over and over and over and over again. So, um, yeah, it's an honor to speak to you. Um, Thank I, you. Nice I, to speak I, with you, too. Yeah, well, I, I checked out a couple of interviews that you've done recently. And there was some great stuff um, where you talk about your sense of time. I did want to touch on your background. I think a lot of people have covered um, your college days. And I was pretty surprised to learn. I learned in the last couple of weeks that you were a really, really good saxophone player. You played lead auto in was it the North Texas State. Yeah, band? North. Yeah. I mean, that's one that the one o'clock bands. I I think that's one of those things you see in downbeat over here. Or people all over, all over the world have heard of that band. So that's just unfair. It's a great. Uh, yeah, it's a it gathers talent from all over the world. Basically, that's the great part of North Texas is that it was uh, you know one of the first colleges to concentrate on jazz. Stan Kenton uh, gave copies of a lot of his charts, maybe his whole book, to the band. Right. So they had that access to that and a bunch of Billy Byers charts for Count Basie and, and then all of the students that went there and wrote things like D. Barton and people that went on to write for Stan Kenton's band. Mm. You know, so it was a, people came from all over the country. So we, the competition was uh, intense uh, and the music was great, you know, and adventurous. That was the nice thing about it is that uh, if you listen to those early North Texas bands, the ones with Norm, uh, Marv Stam and uh, D. Barton, uh, they called it the music from their moon bag, is that what they called it, which was like, the further out, the better. You know, it was the time when jazz was stretching its parameters. It's before the rock thing came along, uh, is when that, uh, that part of North Texas uh, became a seminal part of their uh, program. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure academically there's great things about it, but I think it's the gathering of talented people that made it a great, a great thing. I mean, that, yeah, what a great uh, environment to come up, up through. So one thing I'm interested in is, I guess this is two questions really. First of all, where did you get your sense of harmony from? That's, that's the first part of this question. So does that come from those studies, studying jazz heads and learning how to improvise? Well, you know, um, it's interesting. Uh, when I started guitar, uh, I was too small to play regular guitar. I was five years old and I wanted to learn guitar. So they taught me uh, on a on a lap steel tuned to an E chord. Wow. And then they labeled the frets with a piece of, a, uh, you know, adhesive medical tape and labeled one through 12. And so all of the tabulature was on how far you go from fret to fret. So now you go to fret five and that's a four chord. So the, the four chord, five chord, that uh, uh, language was not part of it. But the idea that, oh, I see, that's th the four chord that you'd go to. It's just, you just move it all up. Oh, and then the five chord, and you don't think it's five, you just think it's seven, you know, one to five to seven frets. Yeah. And oh, here's an interesting chord. Some songs have the two in there, right? So, you know, you're learning Hawaiian songs or something. It's a, it's a lap steel. But uh, I think I think the underpinning for jazz, uh, for not jazz, for music theory is uh, is similar in a way to a keyboard because a keyboard, you know, low is here and high is here. And you can kind of see what you're hearing in a way. Yeah. I think I think maybe that was a, a, a nice underpinning because uh, and then I started uh, I, I quit actually after a year. I, I did really well, but I didn't like the special attention. So I, I quit until uh, rock music started getting, putting out instrumentals. Link Ray, uh, Dwayne Eddy, uh, and uh, and then I wanted to play regular guitar. So I went back to the same teacher and took uh, 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 you know get regular guitar lessons. So really, I played uh, you know, and I did learn by reading, you know, key of C, key of G, got to, got to the key of D with two sharps and 
It was too complicated. I didn't want to think about that. And, but besides, I already figured out where Chuck Berry was getting all of his licks, you know, off the F, the F shape. So I kind of quit lessons then. I, I got it from here. And I just gradually, from learning all the instrumentals, the instrumentals could be hits back then. So you every couple of months, you know, some new thing, Wipeout or a Pipeline uh, or Link Ray with the Rumble or, uh, you know, all of his things. Uh, Dwayne Eddy, you know, Rebel Rouser. You're playing melody on a guitar. And uh, I found a local group and we got together every week and uh, played all those instrumentals. So I learned gradually to just play melodies. And by the time I got interested in jazz, uh, the drummer in our group became a jazz snob. He went, he started going to college. He was or, or older than the rest of us. And he gave me a couple of uh, Hence, he said, here's this Mickey Baker book, and you can learn, learn some jazz chords. And here's a couple of uh, really hip tunes. One was, uh, uh, had the word guacamora in the, in the name. Oh, they sure. were very corny tunes. As, oh, yeah. There were things in guacamora, I think. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's that structure that's completely different than all the stuff that I learned, right? Yeah. So uh, at least I had a book that had the shapes of the chords in them, though I didn't really put those into use very much. But as I, I found that if I started to try to make up melodies for these chords, which is what jazz is, you're, you've got a standard set of chords and you're making up a new melody. And often it's fast because that's the product is a virtuosic, you know, gymnastic uh, exploration of these changes, right? And... Uh, so uh, I found that I could play what I hear pretty much. I, you know, I would fumble and oh yeah, that's here, it's not here. It's, you know, but working mainly off that F position. And, but then I found out in the Mickey Baker book, oh, well they work off of the, what would be a C, uh, an open C chord, except you put your little finger where the low C is and you move it up here. So that's a major position. The F chord position kind of becomes a, you know, you play that low, uh, root with your, not with this finger, like it would be on a blues thing, but with this finger, and then you make all your scales that way. Mm -hmm. So from that, uh, I was able to just kind of structure a, a loose ear playing what you hear. So, you know, it was gradual, and I wasn't intense with the study. I was just consistent and, uh, you know, would go with binges occasionally, like a Dwayne Eddy record had a, a song called Trambone which was a his idea of a uh, Chet Atkins type, uh, you know, Travis picking thing. Right. Melodies on the top, and you're doing, you know. Um, you said to have a guitar handy. I've got one right, here. Bro. Let me see if it's still, see if it's still working. I can, uh, let me unmute my system here. Uh, You hear that well enough? Yep, yeah, right. Yeah. Do this. Ah. Uh. Okay, well, I should learn that. I was uh, there was an older guy my dad worked with, who was a great Chet Atkins type guitar player, and so we would get together whenever they would get together to play cards. He'd bring a guitar, and we'd sit down and play some. So I could hear that it's possible to do that, and I just sat down with that thing very slow because I couldn't I couldn't get the well, like just then I couldn't get it <laughs> because I haven't done it in a while. But uh, it, it's. Uh, I just did it very slow. Until it became a thing that wasn't foreign anymore. Yeah. And then I could, I could and, it, and it came together. And it became, of course, that whole structure is the, uh, is the basis for finger picking, folk finger picking. Yeah. Same thing. But uh, I didn't get into that yet. It didn't have an acoustic or anything like that. So I, didn't, I applied that later on. 
But uh, to get you back to the sense of harmony, it started simple and on simple songs, rock and roll, country, um, you know, or, you know, you go around the horn, you know, like uh, one, six, four, five, one, six, two, five, you know, those were common rock, rock and roll changes. So, you know, it just built, well, that's the basis of bebop anyway, though, if you, you know, it, it, that around the horn, they call it. Yeah. So uh, that, that, you know, that was that. And then when I got into high school and got interested in playing the horn, I was in the band as a, as a guitarist, but I uh, uh, needed to get in the proper band program and learn a horn to stay in the, in the jazz band in high school. Yeah. And so I did learn the horn and uh, learned to read music then at the same time and then applied that to guitar. And then I started writing charts the records we were listening to, the Kenton records and the uh, Woody Herman records were way more uh, interesting than the stock charts that we had. And there were contests in Texas for, for I, was, I lived in Fort Worth, which is an hour away from North Texas. And uh, so we needed hipper charts, so I learned to arrange uh, for a big band. Uh, there were a couple of good books. One, the great book that I got that really gave me a foothold was uh, uh, Russell Garcia's uh, professional arranger composer and uh, you know it's all the basics and uh, so I got into and, and another thing when I learned to read music and here's a good thing if you're just learning to be, read music I think I learned as much from writing uh, I guys in my band I couldn't I could play by ear in this jazz band and the guys that had been in the band program who were just newly into this jazz band did couldn't play by ear so they couldn't write down they asked me to do takedowns of take five and a few. So I could barely read, but in doing the takedowns, I learned a lot about reading. Hmm. Because if you have to translate it from what's in your head to the paper, then it you're already on the inside track of what it is to read a piece of music and make it sound like it's in here, not out there. I guess that's part of that is, is, is thinking about the details and there with notation. I kind of know what you mean. I remember years ago, I was in the, the National Youth Jazz Orchestra over here a long time ago. And I met this guy who gave me a transcribing gig for a big publisher called Music Sales. And that's where I sort of, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not on your level, but you know, I read for a living. But I remember transcribing John Schofield and Matheny, but also Eric Clapton playing slow blues. And that really made me think about the specifics. So it's that, isn't it? It's that connection with the specifics. Yeah. And you're at a deeper level when, when you're doing it that way, right? You're you're at the level of the creator of the music, making it into notation. It's not as a, such a foreign thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the extraordinary thing about the North Texas band is that they were sight reading stuff and make it sound like they knew it by heart. Mm. It wasn't they weren't just chopping out the notes and putting them on the right beat. Mm. You know, they were swinging it. It was like phrasing it together and like making it go and where's the cutoff let's do this together let's make it a little longer to make it more soulful and it was almost went without saying because as everybody was doing it you know the cohesion the desire for cohesion made it happen really mm. but it also for as you know playing a professional chart if you just stomped out the notes it wouldn't be very interesting to hear you really have to see what the intention was and then play the intention right that's the point of notation it's it's a it's a message in a bottle about what the music is right yeah yeah interesting turn of phrase yeah so that's you were in that world and you sort of have to improvise on charts and that that's the start of that then obviously getting deeper yeah. into lines and the way people navigate harmony yeah, it was, uh, you know, we had one song uh, in our high school jazz band. I was playing lead alto at that point, but then, by then, and it was a transcription of Charlie Parker's Groove and High, and the sax soli was his solo, right. uh, harmonized as a, as a sax uh, section. So, I mean, all those kind of things, and, and, and we did, uh, there were, there was a couple of local arrangers in Dallas that wrote very interesting charts too. So by playing them and plowing through the charts and, 
and hearing the chords and how they get through the chords in interesting ways. Uh, you, you learn a lot by osmosis yeah. as well. You know, I think, and I think osmosis is probably the, the way most of it happens. Wow. You, you have, you, you do have to hit it once. If you, if you sit next to somebody that's way better at you at something, then, then it's time to go to the private room and uh, figure out what the heck handle you can get on it to do what they did, right? You take it as inspiration, not uh, to, not depression, <laughs> right? Ideally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got to say this to you. I'm just in watching a couple of interviews, and obviously I've seen you play. The few things I've seen you playing live and obviously on records, there's a kind of, the, it's, it's partly a, uh, an intellect, a strong intellect and a strong determination. Every time I've heard you talked about anything uh, to do with the process of playing music, be it chops or musicianship or reading or anything, there's a sort of clarity and determination in the way you play that it just comes out of records. Um, mm. Do you mind if I just take a little le step to, to the left for a second? There's one thing I have to ask you this. I've got a chart on my other screen here. Did okay. you play that part on Green Flower Street, I don't know if I can play, Green Flower Street by Donald Fagan that goes. Is that you playing that? Yeah. I've got to ask you, is that your, is that your idea? Yeah. Oh, man. The, whole, the whole thing is mine. It was a chord sheet, baby. Oh, man, that is, I mean, the way that, that, the way that evolves is another little. Um, well, you know, I, part, part of the thing with working with Donald, I knew that he was attracted to quirky things. So I thought, you know, I put, the th I wouldn't do that if I were playing for, uh, you know, I don't know, a, a stock recording session because yeah. it would be kicked out as too weird you know we haven't heard that before yeah right <laughs> but i knew that donald was interested in hearing things that yeah. he hasn't heard before yeah yeah i mean I, that is what that, that's that language of music this this kind of harmony and whole thing is very adventurous but i'm even more glad i asked you know but that's such a master stroke that thing and the way that i mean i guess it doesn't this won't translate when people are watching this i'm looking looking at a transcription i did moderately hastily because i was playing with Playing this with somebody else, but the way you evolve that, you've got the next, and then, and then it evolves. As you, uh, it's constantly evolving, but the core of it doesn't go too far from the original cell, the original idea. It's oh man, thank you, <laughs> thank, thank you for all for all the guitar play. For making that <laughs> such a funky and imaginative part, man, I love that. Honestly, oh, thank yeah. you. That's such a thrill to learn that thing. And chops also. That brings me back to the 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 idea of how how you practice. I guess we'll we'll touch on this soon enough. But there's a focus in the way you a pick. That's so happening, so precise. That record that. You've obviously sat down and decided you weren't going to have any irregularities. If you want it to be perfect, it's going to be perfect. So one thing I, I would like to touch on at some point is what was your routine for getting that kind of stuff together? Because there are a lot of guitar players who flail around, but I think very few of them could play in that controlled way. And in addition to that, you're you're creating, apart from the fact you've originated the idea. So what's what's I've sort of taken a step away from the harmony. I'll come back to that. But what's mm -hmm. your? How did you get that so happening? Your your uh, both hands. I was coordination, obviously, but your, your articulation. Well, let's see if I could get this thing working. When I first started finger picking, I had to learn finger picking. I figured before I moved to LA because I saw Glenn Campbell. He had just had a hit record on Gentle on My Mind, and he was, you know, he was able to play it. Uh, let me get a clearer sound here for you. So I just sat down with a metronome, you know, and it was sloppy at first. And 
they're just going to sit with a metronome until it sounds like I'm leading the metronome. And I would set it for, let's see, let's go down to half that speed. That was 100. And I'm trying to get this funky little metronome down to 50, and here we go. So. maybe even a slower metronome. And uh, you just keep playing until the metronome seems very happy. You know, here's the tempo. So, so no flams with them. So you have to be become uh, really friends with the click. Yeah. And especially now, everybody records to click. Back then, no one really, I mean, if you did a jingle or a movie, you had to record to a click. Yeah. But uh, it was not a precise thing. The guys that recorded to click back then used it as a reminder of where they needed to end up. And so they play ahead of it and behind it and actually had a really uh, natural way of handling uh their thing with the click but it wasn't precise you know it wouldn't it doesn't fit in like a glove like players now um are so friendly with the click that they can do that but you have to you have to get there so that it's not a struggle you're not playing slightly ahead you're not playing slightly behind you're making it sound like the click is following you and i think carol k uh recommends putting the click on the on the after beat and you know, as a, as a, as it's a backbeat. But anyway, I, you know, I just drilled it uh, slow then faster, and um, and then it became natural. Uh, I, I've always had a pretty natural, good feeling of time, though. I was not a rusher or a dragger um, back when I was playing in my kid band. So you know, the fundamentals. I don't know what to say about, uh, you know, about how uh, how much you can learn. But I know that no one starts out perfect. Yeah. You know, you can always you know, like things like uh, when you play loud, you're going to play faster. So you have to train yourself out of that. And, and a metronome is a really good way to do that. Because uh, play something soft and play it loud. And, it, you know, it, it will be surprising at first. Your first day will be depressing. Yeah. But, you know, just think on that first day. Yeah, it's depressing. But think how good I play and I, and, and I suck at this think how much better it'll be when I don't suck at this and yeah. continue to plow through until that becomes. And now it's, uh, you know, if, if I haven't been playing for a while um, uh, and some of the fundamentals drift away or doesn't feel completely connected, it seems like phoning it in, you just keep playing until it is natural again, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, I suppose you're led by your ear as well, aren't you? You know, you, you can feel if things aren't sitting or if they're not landing in the way you want. Your, with your level of experience, your ear is going to tell you exactly what needs to be kept up, if anything. Um, well, yeah, you know, uh, it's, uh, though it's surprising when I've come off of a vacation and have my first session after a vacation. And I think it's just fucking killing. It's great. And I go in and listen, listen to the playback, and it's like, really? Well, you're ahead of the beat in that part of it, and uh, and why does it sound like you're just piecing it together? You know, how about some flow? You know, you don't hear that while you're doing it necessarily, especially if you're not, you don't realize you're not up to speed from being, you know, from being off the job for a while. Yeah. But you get back and you realize, oh, I I, I now I remember this is work. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's so work it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, God, I'm all over the place. Back to harmony, if you don't mind. So, okay. you know, you've got that that grounding, and obviously you're playing a lot uh, when you're coming up. Did you 
have to work in any way to amend your sense of harmony when you ended up playing on those slick sort of uh very sophisticated soul and r and b influence but jazz harmony influence kind of things i'm thinking of like michael mcdonald things obviously steely done that kind of thing was there a time you can remember where you were having to sort of reinvent your harmonic style or did it all just you know just Evolve. Well, since I had a strong, I had a, I had a strong jazz comfort from playing horns, and you know, I, I did play. You know, there are several bands in North Texas: one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock. Back when I was there, so there's five bands. I always played in another band on guitar as well. Right. So I played in two bands, and I would sub on bass maybe at the six o'clock if someone wanted. Me. One guy was out of town, and so I bought went and bought a bass and uh, learned to play bass clef, <laughs> which was yeah. very handy because because a lot of times on rhythm dates, uh, especially on these kind of charts that you're talking about, it's uh, you know the complex uh, Whitney Houston type uh, you know uh, harmonies which are jazz based. It's a bass line, it's a, a bass staff and a treble staff and a guitar rhythm in the middle and slashes and one set of chord changes to read and the bass part sometimes you'd be asked to double the bass part or you'd get an idea to double the bass part yeah. and it's nice to be able to read bass clef because it's just sitting right there yeah. so uh i didn't so i didn't have to change uh you know one thing i noticed about playing backbeats uh you know chinks when i first was reading on guitar because I did some sessions in Dallas, they had a strong, uh, you know, jingle commercial music center there. Did either Chicago or Dallas did all the regional commercials, and so we would get tons of uh, that kind of stuff coming through. And uh, on backbeats, you know, you don't really play the whole chord of a backbeat. You just need the first three strings. So you know, you learn that a uh, that F major seven backbeat. Yeah, there's no F in that, right? You're just playing the, uh, here's uh, F major seven. It's like a, like a C major seven moved up to here. You're just playing that little A minor thing on top. It's the same notes without the root. You don't need the root. And, uh, you know, for, So in taking the chord apart like that and just playing uh, the non-root part of it, um, it, it's handy in going through solos. Uh, like if you're, if you're playing an F major seven chord in a solo, well, you can just kind of pretend you're on an A minor. You know, that, that all fits there. You know, just take little fragments of it and riff on those fragments. Uh, you know. Fourth, you know, those take yeah. you a long way. So, um, you know, kind of every piece of it can inform every other piece. I, I, I was, uh, I was also sort of uh, careful not to get bored on a gig. If I had to do thirty takes, there was one particularly troublesome drummer in Motown sessions, and it would take him like 20 takes to settle down and get it. We weren't cutting to a click and none of that was happening. So you'd have to play a thing over and over again. And so I would just do little exercises like and play a rhythm part with my fingers instead of my pick for a while, or yeah. just figure out how far back I could lean it and have it still feel good, or how much on top, you know, that you sort of do use it as a practice session <laughs> so you're not wasting your time right yeah. Uh, yeah yeah there's no no time wasting necessary yeah well actually you've actually, actually touched on something i wanted to ask you i mean i, I was going to ask you how much i mean i suppose it's, it's like asking how long is a piece of string but how much do, do you find yourself making very conscious decisions about where to put things particularly things like chicks on two and four 
do you walk in a room and think, oh, it's these guys are they're going to play way behind? I should play a hair behind, or? Well, I, you know, I, I found myself uh, with one particular drummer in L.A. Uh, I would play, and then we're all playing to click. You know, this is a recent session in, in, the, in the days now where you're always got a click going. Yeah. And I'm, I th I'm locked in, and then I go in and hear it, and I'm ahead. And uh, and so one of the playbacks I listen, and this drummer is intentionally playing behind the click. Mm. So I'm out there like like a fool playing to the click, and so I kind of with him now turn the click down quite a bit. I can hear it there because in the spaces you still need it, yeah. but in the real world of what I'm playing, I'm listening to him and playing in the middle of his groove. Wow. Wow. Um, so, uh, but so I guess to answer your question, I, I'll do that kind of anal analysis defensively for defensive purposes, but not as far as me putting it on when I'm doing tracks at home or something, I just play it right with the click. You know, it's just so easy. It lines up. It always feels good that way and you're playing to machines and early versions of things sometimes you're doing in your home studio anyway yeah. you know maybe the keyboard player hasn't even put his final part on yet if he's the producer he might do his part last you know so he gets to play to the band yeah. uh, so uh, feeling good with the click is uh, you know all there's another drummer in LA that as he calls it he buries the click meaning you can never hear the click when he's playing with it because it's right in the middle of it so huh. you know i what I, what I can vary though that'll change the feel considerably is on the uh, interior uh, subdivisions like if you're on an r b thing and it's a uh, this is your click you know and you can so that's pretty straight or you can play That's a shuffle, like that's it's in it's subdividing triplets rather than and you can relax, you can kind of uh fool around with that little quantization. A little swing to it just yeah. a little bit yeah but the the click parts are right, all right on you're not you're not displacing yourself from the click yeah at all yeah i mean that's sort of i mean but you can you know if it... say again no sorry sorry i didn't mean to interrupt sorry oh that, that that's that's kind of all of it it just seems that uh, that sort of liquid phrasing has always been around. Isn't that? I can't remember where I read it. I think I was a student. I was reading that somebody talking about Mozart with playing over those, I think they're called Alberti basses, where you get like. And he was saying, keep that perfect and then make sure you've practiced to the point where you can play lyrically over the top of it. Wow. So the one is free from the other. So Errol Garner. Errol Garner did, could do that also. Right. You know, he, uh, if you listen to his solos he's playing freddie green kind of part in his left hand and it's always on yeah and then yeah he, he he definitely worked on that yeah and uh, and those ragtime guys the, the best ones figured that out yeah yeah as well i can ask you one other thing because it's just in my mind because i've been listening to it i made a little playlist of a few things i meant to do i yeah, i checked out a wikipedia page on you and the list of stuff i didn't realize you played it's ridiculous it's incredible i meant to make a long file of stuff to listen to and i i wanted to transcribe a lot of stuff but i was working so anyway but i listened this is a track i've listened to thousands of times but i think a lot of people know the story with or some of the story with haitian divorce so you part on that so it's it's true right that you played conventionally and then walter becker did the voice box thing reamping that's right right 
yeah. that solo man is just that that's incredible it's just incredible that's one of the best guitar solos in recording music and i tell you another thing with it uh i was just listening to it when i was on the bath that's got to be the greatest proportion of a steely dan record where a guy's allowed to solo it's got to be there's more solo oh, than, yes. than i think it, i doubt there's another steely dan track with more soloing by anybody certainly by one person and it's unbelievably inventive you got like albert there's an albert kingy sort of minor third bend in there there's classic sort of chicago blues and there's this melodic development terrifying it's terrifying i'm going to transcribe it i've got a big gig next week I'm definitely going to transcribe it when i get home but i mean that's unbelievable and i just i honestly think that's one of the top handful of recorded guitars or particularly in this kind of music i think my peer group i'm pretty much everybody i ever play with is a massive fan of the kind of things you do and steely dan are everybody's favorite band but um oh man in that world of sort of grown-up jazz influenced groove music wow so you know that please don't tell me that was like a one take thing please don't tell me that well, it wasn't exactly one take. Uh, the little signature lines, we'd stop at every one of those and I would relearn it sort of, because yeah. it's not something that I ever rehearsed with a group. I did play on the tracking session, so um, I was familiar with the song in general. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? I had heard it uh, the two or three times we did it to get a take. Yeah. Um, but the solo was an overdub and uh but uh, it was a good day i have to say you know it was a uh, um uh i was in the booth they were at that time they were monitoring on magna planar electrostatic speakers which are big panels one for the left and one for the right and it sounded crystal clear it sounded like you were in the middle of the band so um so it was fun just to, to play along but it did come pretty easily and pretty quickly it wasn't a pulling teeth thing yeah. it was uh, oh let's start back there i got an idea you know and and kind of play uh two or three sections and then do a bunch in after you know at every signature lick basically you'll know that from the signature lick on it's probably a single take and then at every signature lick uh you know stop the presses okay what is this thing again and i play it i you know maybe maybe one time i got it in the heat of battle but it wasn't uh it wasn't you know it wasn't pieced together from thousands of takes or several tracks or anything like that it was uh, we did do it on the, on the fly well, i'm going to learn from something you said earlier i'm, gonna, I'm not going to allow myself to get depressed by that but that is something Quite something. So, what sort of what did that sound like in the room? Though, what was your guitar tone? If you if, can you recall what sort of tone you had when, when you? Uh, probably the probably the. Let me see if I can uh, get this thing to working again. For some reason, it uh, is not. Where is that? I don't know. My guitar stopped working. Oh, they will do that. I'm just not showing up here. So could it be that my amp is taking a crap? Let me switch to a different amp here. I've got uh, I don't know if you can see that. Oh yeah. A few amps to choose from. No, it's not the amp. Oh, I see what it is. Pilot error. <laughs> volume pedal uh, so it was probably uh, probably the rear pickup of a uh, was a 335 you know, some kind of like that yeah, right. sound. so a nice rear pickup. overdrive sort of sound yeah 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 but there was enough uh, I don't think I was using a compressor proper on the thing. 
I know Jay Graydon used an orange squeezer when he did Peg. So it, is, it was in the day when we would use an MXR or something, but I don't think I did. I think it was just me into an amp. Uh, must have been an amp in the control room because I wasn't using amp heads. It was a Princeton probably. Wow. Yeah, so it was a lot like that. Yeah, yeah. You're saying. Was that a common choice for you in those days? What what sort of arsenal of amps would you lug to it or get somebody else to lug to a session? And do you have loads with you or? No, I didn't have much on the amp front in, in those days. It was the Princeton mainly, just turn it up or turn it down. Yeah. It was a good neutral amp. Um, I know that uh, I think Carlton in those days had after he got out of studio work and was doing more of a solo thing, got into the Mesa Boogie thing for a while. Uh, uh, until he heard my, uh, I had a, a Dumble and he heard that and started using Dumbles. Ooh, he actually sat in on my rig with the uh, Abel Boreal's band and I was playing the uh, the crank parts on a Dumble, a uh, 50 watt. Uh, so I did, I did bring that into, that was the first outside amp I brought into my fold. And then maybe I used uh, a basement head sometimes uh, with a load box. Uh, it was a speaker inside of a speaker, just to load the amp, really, not a mic speaker inside of a road case. Yeah. And put somewhere where you don't hear it. And then uh, use that as a, a way to feed a power amp into another speaker, you know, as a. Uh, I, I kind of went to that configuration. And then this uh, Marshall Jubilee uh, I found and started putting that out. I like the way that thing sounded in the crank mode. And I uh, had this um, a little, uh, what, a TC Electronic uh, rack unit. We went to racks at some point. And I always take up the harsh middle, which was a, the narrowest I could make it at about 1.5K or something. That, that thing, yeah. take, you know, take that down. Yeah. And so the crank sound would be something you could hear up close and it wouldn't hurt. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, at some point I found this, I guess it's when John Harrington played with the uh, live with Steely Dan, I heard this Guytron head and I really liked it and got one of those. And, and that's been a good, uh, really good two channel with a proper effects loop. You actually have a 20 watt amp, the 20 watt tube amp in the front end, and then your 100 watt amp is at the back end after the effects loop. So you get some a good two channels choice of what squish you want. You know, you, you have an output, an input, and a, a single tone control for each of those channels. And then your uh, other thing with the uh, with the four, three tone controls and a presence are just for after that. So you can put effects there and get all your delays that you like completely clean and get a really real uh, overdrive sound. So that's what I've been going with lately. Although I have a divided by 13 here at home, I'm, I'm completely in the head configuration, mic the heads. And I do the, uh, these days I do the delay effects uh, virtually. Wow. So it helps with, with the punching in and all that stuff. There's no, not a delay trail that's going to be, you know, I can have a really generous delay going yeah, and chop in a part just like that because the part I'm actually recording is not delayed at all. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, not, it's, it's just the source. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's a, that's a good uh, model for the day today. Did you persist with the Dumble or did you get rid of that at some point? Do you, do you still have that thing? Well, uh, Mr. Dumble has it and won't give it back to me. Oh, that's, no. <laughs> that's, that's the, he's, uh, he's convinced it. Well, I, I'm not going to go into it here, but, uh, that's the situation. Oh dear. With the Dumble. I wish I'd asked. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's a whole industry, isn't it? I mean, the Dumble derivatives, as I call it, you know, there are a lot of people who make very good apps, very strongly inspired by those apps um yeah yeah that's a whole thing but uh yeah i mean john's got a really good i know john a little bit um he's got a blue john. tone as well which is worth checking out uh, to get a chance yeah. say it again uh, blue do tone 
Oh, he's a very yeah, it's a knockoff, right? Is that is that a knockoff? Or is it... Very strongly based on a Dumble. I think he's probably put his own tweaks on it, and they're good. But yeah, maybe worth a look, you know. Uh, yeah, that's what uh, I think. Sorry, Larry, Larry Carlton is using one of those too, or I've seen Larry them. Carlton. Robin Ford used one for a while. Larry Carlton's still using one, I think. Uh, in fact, he's mm -hmm. got. I think he's got several rigs. He's got one in Japan, one in Europe, and at least one in the yeah, States. I have to say, Dumble is uh, most one of the most ingenious, uh, genius characters that I know. Uh, you know his knowledge of amps, uh, and his knowledge of a lot of things. He's just a really uh, intellectually sharp. Uh, uh, he's a great tone detective, you know. On, and completely understands tube amps and really figured out a lot of things uh, early before anyone figured it, any of the stuff out. And uh, um, it, it was amazing hearing his amp for the first time because that was, it did seem to be Andy Browers, the one that told me uh, about Dumble and lent me his uh, amp for a while. But yeah, it's now uh, a, a lot of people have been collecting that kind of knowledge and uh, it's, it's kind of kind of wonderful, you know. Things things do get better, and yeah. a lot of knowledge made for a lot of great amps to choose from. Yeah, and amps that you can afford because obviously uh, there's only one Alexander Dumble, so you know I guess the guy should. So it's his invention as well. So there's intellectual copyright to it as well, isn't there? It's his thing, so he should charge. Yeah, it. you know, I, I, I it would be great uh, if uh, him and and artists, you know, people that do pieces of art. And with this new NFT kind of uh, uh, technology, blockchain technology, it would be great if artists that make something that becomes hugely inflated in price later would get a piece of each after sale. Mm. I think that would be completely wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, Because making amps uh, and guitars um you know like olsen his the guitar that he made now james taylor plays them and there when i bought my olsen only guy i knew playing it was uh phil kagi and i played his and i thought well this is great okay 1800 bucks i got one <laughs> and now it's what uh, you know eighteen thousand, and you wait three years or something i don't know it's uh yeah. and why shouldn't he you know if uh, me or phil sell one of our guitars for that a much why shouldn't he have a slice of that right yeah. that's a nice nice of you to think that i'm yeah. going to take you on another left turn if you don't mind i've got to ask you about the david crosby connection because um james raymond introduced this obviously and i i've been so, asking yeah. james to do an interview and i'm a i'm a massive fan of those uh, really the re recent david crosby records have got me into the older stuff i kind of missed that i, I totally missed that when I was coming up, but that mm -hmm. tune, I, I, I won't bang on about it too much because I did grill James about it. I take him down the changes of that tune. She's got to be somewhere, but man, it's, you sound just like Dean Parks on that record. It's, it's great. <laughs> it's really lovely. So I thought whoever this guy is, that is, oh, I, I see. Okay. It's, it's that guy. It's the same guy plays on all those <laughs> other things. And then, then, so that's well, a few years ago. Now, that latest record, the tune Rodriguez for a night, which I also discussed with James in our interview, is fascinating. I, I would call it sort of post Steely Dan Harmony because James has got his own twist on it. I was saying to him, you know, a lot of yeah. people think I like Steely Dan, so you get uh, things like you get those. Oh, sorry, my guitar's on it. You get those kind of triad or bass, I was th but that's just. Yeah. That's just stolen from Steely Dan tunes, like yeah. you know, Josie kind of stuff. James doesn't do that. James is too honorable for that. So he's got his own thing. You think that sounds like Steely Dan, but it's not stolen from Steely Dan. It's like, like a development. Uh, that, am I right in thinking that James kind of sketched out the idea for the rhythm part for that team, Rodriguez, for a night, and you executed his idea with your own personality? Is that right? Uh, I have to look at it. Some parts um, he actually did on keyboard, and I replaced them with guitar, right? right. With a real guitar sound. Yeah, right. there's uh, those. 
I think there's one part that I just made up. Uh, I, I can't remember. I did a couple of things with them. Right. And I'm not sure I have them separated uh, correctly to do a, although I may have it here. I don't know if I could. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. But, yeah. I, 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 uh, I'm just interested in that connection because you've played with David Crosby for a long time on recording projects. How did that, how, how long have you known him? Um, you know, I worked uh, on a uh, Graham Nash, his solo record, his first, was it his first? I don't know. It was his uh, 90s solo record that uh, Russ Kunkel and had produced. And maybe Nathaniel was in on that too, his son. Uh, and then he went on the road and asked me to go on the road. I went on the road and then Crosby joined the tour and that's when I uh, met him. So that was early, you know, and maybe 2000, wow. the year 2000 or something like that. Um, and then uh, they decided to tour as a duo. They've, they've done records as a duo, with Crosby and Nash. Yeah. And so uh, they enjoyed that. I don't think there was a lot of, you know, we didn't play huge stadiums. We played the uh, opera houses and stuff like that, but which is a beautiful environment. Yeah. But there was a lot of guitar to play because I was basically playing Neil Young and uh, uh, Stephen Stills position on the legacy tunes yeah. and on the new tunes, whoever had played on the sessions. Play that, as, but, but mainly I was improvising the whole thing, you know, as it comes right down to it. I'm just improvising in their style and with their with that sound of, you know, almost cutting my hair or a uh, long time gone, that kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, I have to say uh, that there are all kinds of rock and roll tours. And, uh, you know, there's tours by bands that absolutely enforce that you play everything like the record with the exact sound of the record. And uh, if it's not that, well, then our fans are being disappointed. And uh, so that's one kind of tour. But that wasn't this, these kind of tours. Uh, the further out I would take a solo or a, a part, the bigger the grin on Crosby and Nash. I mean, they were like the true rock and roll spirit. Yes, we are inventing something new tonight. And because we said it, it's true tonight. You know, this is our new definitive performance and tomorrow will be a different one right. and they were up for that which made it total dream Wonderful. dream big yeah it was it was totally fun it was uh there was a lot to cover on those gigs because i was playing the acoustic parts on some things uh electric parts on some i uh got my pedal steel onto the gig so i was playing a few songs on pedal steel and uh, so it was a lot of hopping around, but musically very enjoyable with a really musical group. You know, James was on keyboard. Oh, that's where I met him at the same at the same time. He was on the keyboard on the on those gigs. Um, totally great. So yeah, it was. So I met Crosby then, and then uh, they did an album. Crosby said he had a couple of lyrics. Would I write music to it? Uh, or we talked about it and decided that I'd, I'd love to do that. So I did, got a couple of songs I wrote with Crosby on that. And so we we do a few of those, you know, he's got a couple of lyrics, other lyrics standing by, I saw him a week ago. So we're going to get started on some other thing. Oh, lovely. Fantastic. But we co-wrote one of the things on the new album. The, uh, the uh, Nobody Shot at Me Today, I think. Fantastic. About, oh, a, about, a, about a soldier's thinking, you know, how a soldier thinks about getting through his day yeah. when he's in combat on the front lines. Interesting viewpoint. Wonderful. I mean, wow. That's so beautiful. These, these latest David Crosby albums are just so great. I mean, the new one is so killer. He's amazing at singing oh. over this complex harmony as well. He's, he's a great musician, David Crosby. It's like, I'm going to look oh, yeah. at I'm, I'm really going to get deeper into all of it. Fantastic. Amazing. Well, they, yeah, they really, you know, all of these gigs that we did every gig, him and Graham did a version of uh, Guinevere. I don't know if you're familiar with Guinevere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, still maybe the most elegant guitar part in rock music. 
and he plays it and sings it flawlessly yeah. and you know with with grandma you know uh they're currently not uh they they're not talking <laughs> but uh, it's uh you know that's a that's a pretty deep piece of music and uh and uh, crosby you know figured that out and identified it you know he he was a curator of all great musical things and he's been in i've been a fan of the birds uh in the the crosby era of the birds um you know my uh my high school beetle band you know beetles birds hendrix cream wow. uh, yeah zeppelin pretty uh, good uh, oh man yeah pretty pretty good if you think about that time of uh of uh of music it was great and then when crosby stills and ash came out you know uh that was like a rarefication taken you know one notch higher and mostly expressed in vocal harmonies yeah uh, but uh you know move the music forward uh in a really great courageous and successful way and so yeah. it was so it was fun for me to make music with david because he'd been uh on the ground floor either as a perpetrator or as a witness to a lot of great uh music invention so invention is like the highest form of uh participation for david and for me you know as a, as a former jazz snob because when i got into saxes i temporarily became oh well this stuff is simple this stuff is elegant jazz is elegant rock is simple and then jazz started to disintegrate somewhat at a time when rock started to take off and hendrix had the power and imagination of a coltrane yeah and uh you know you you've got you got birds and then crosby stills and nash you know ex relentlessly the beatles would not repeat themselves so they kept developing and they made it possible for everyone else to have that courage to develop it further instead of going down the same road yeah. develop it further and your audience will follow you at the time the audiences were into it and they listened intently so it was a it was a great uh fertile time when invention was rewarded and encouraged to, and so traveling with crosby was that same spirit amazing great there's gig. a thing, there's great a thing gig I, I, years ago i did i did martial arts for a while i was rubbish at it but i kind of enjoyed it as an exercise but there's uh -huh. a big thing in martial arts where they trace the lineage of the people you've studied with. So if you study with a guy who's got a direct line to the guy who invented Aikido, for instance, that's a huge deal. You know, that's if you've got that lineage where this guy yeah. studied with that guy who studied with that guy. So you're like three places removed. That's a, you know, you're true to the source there. And so those, those names you mentioned, Crosby being a big force, a part of the source of everything we listen to. You got me think I've got a gig. I'm going to Athens next week. I've got a gig with this new project, which is playing the music of Led Zeppelin in an orchestra. And I've transcribed all of the Jimmy Page stuff, including the slow blues stuff. And just taking that music apart is interesting to pick up. Oh, there's a bit of Hendrix there. There's a bit of Eric Clapton there. But in their music, their, their acoustic stuff, I w I'd love to ask Robert Plant how much of an influence Crosby, Stills, Nash, or Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young would have been on that. So. What I'm getting at really is you're plugged apart from apart from the fact you created a lot of the music that is my religion and that and that of most of my peers. You're plugged right into that lineage. It's, it shows. It comes out in what you play. So I've seen a couple of things where you're demonstrating gear recently. It's like, oh man, I could just hear you just play whatever comes to mind for hours. It's just so lovely. So I don't want to take any more time. I could talk to you for hours, but I, I feel guilty because I know you, I know you you're working on. So I'm gonna. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to do the right thing and let you go. But I just want to say it's a real honor to talk to you. And thanks for the inspiration. Very kind of you to take the time. Thanks for the excellent interview. I appreciate your knowledge. And it's great to hear you. I'm, I'm going to 
I'm going to search around and listen for you now. <laughs> very kind. <laughs> okay, Dean, listen, thanks very much for your time, as I say, and what an inspiration. Man, I love your playing. Just, it's just, I feel like I'm representing so many people in having the chance to say, I love your playing. It's a real influence. It's a positive force in life as a musician. So thanks again for your time. I'm going to go before I embarrass myself further. All the best. <laughs> Cheers, Dean. Thanks very much. Thanks, man. Bye. Here is our guest, Dean Park.